morning, Tangible Grace. It's good to again share with you today. I, I uh, am so excited to continue to dive into the, our, our story uh, of the parables and diving into stories Jesus told. Uh, this week we're going to be in Luke chapter 18, uh, beginning with verse 1, and we'll, we'll kind of roll through verse 14. But to get started, I wanted to kind of center in on the middle couple of verses of this text that really help us to get at the core, the heart of this text. Uh, The big idea here uh, is in verse 8. It says, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And then the next verse, it says, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were also that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. The big idea here is that uh, Jesus is teaching us that either maybe we have a complete lack of faith, we've completely given up, we've just like, oh God, I just, I don't even want to try anymore. Or on the other extreme, uh, do you have faith in yourself when you should have faith instead of internally on yourself, should you put it externally on God? And so uh, the two ideas here are really, do we trust in nothing and we give it up, or do we trust in ourselves? Do we trust in what we can do and how we can fix things ourselves? I've been thinking a lot about how um, this idea of this phrase, treated others with contempt. Contempt is a word that is one of the most sinister uh, of, of the, the vices, of, of those things that we can do that are, are not of the Spirit. When we treat others with contempt, we fail to see them as created in the image of God equal to us. That, that we fail to see that, that, that others have just as much love for, uh, by God as anyone else And in this text, we see that these Pharisees were just so proud of themselves. They were so self-assured that they treated others as less than. My fear is that we can do the same thing. We can find other ways to define ourselves as better than others that we are smarter or better at blank. No matter what that blank is, whether it's we're better at doing uh, parenting or living through this quarantine and being Pinterest perfect or Instagram worthy or looking like Martha Stewart in all of our pictures. And yet, that's not what it's all about. It's not about having the right political view or the right plan to avert this, this current crisis. It's not about even believing the, the exact right things about the Bible or theology or eating the right things or not eating the right things, or, or, or be cheering for, heaven forbid, cheering for the wrong team. It's not about us being better than someone else, but it's more importantly, it's about seeing others as also created in the image of God. And so instead of seeing others with contempt, instead of thinking, oh, I got to do better, be better, our, our goal is much greater than that, that, that God is calling us to something bigger than that in this text. As I've been wrestling through this, uh, I have to be honest that I've had these moments when I have (laughs) wanted to give up hope. I've wanted to just like, I'm so over this COVID-19 thing. I'm so over trying to find a new normal. And yet in these moments when I try to put faith in myself, when I'm trying to carry burdens that are not mine to shoulder, that are not mine to carry, I realize that I'm trying to do more than God has created me to do. That many times, as Chuck Swindoll loves to say, I I, I have been convicted by close friends and even my wife Heather that I agree with Chuck Swindoll that that a lot of times the Holy Spirit sounds a lot like my wife. That, that, That a lot of times she reminds me that it's not on me the tangible grace or, or our local community or attorney matters most, that it's not on me, that it's on God to cause it to grow, that, that, that it's not on any of us as individuals to make our families the best that they could ever be, that it's not all on us, that we have to trust them into God's hands. Now, that doesn't mean that we're lazy. That doesn't mean that we don't do anything. That doesn't mean that we give up. But it's, it's what, what weight, what burden do we place on ourselves and what burdens do we bring to God in prayer? Because today we're going to focus on two parables on prayer. Two parables that help us to see the realities of Scripture, of what it looks like to bring everything to God in prayer. Not just some things, but everything. All of our burdens of our heart. 
And so my encouragement to you is this, that I pray that, that you would bring those burdens to God and confess those places may, where maybe you've been holding on to things. You've been trying to shoulder things that weren't yours to shoulder. So I encourage you to take a time with your family, to take a few moments to pray and ask God right now, what things have I been shouldering that aren't mine to shoulder? What things have I been carrying that aren't mine to carry? What things have I been holding, white knuckling on that isn't mine to hold that I need to surrender and release? Release them to God in prayer. And so I invite you to pray with me right now. Father, we lift these things to you, knowing that you alone are good, that we can't do enough right things to earn our relationship with you. Help us to not lose heart. Help us not to give up. Help us to not lose faith. But instead, Lord, help us to keep coming over and over and over to you. Help us to trust not in ourselves, but to trust in you. Help us to see others with joy and love and, and hope instead of contempt and seeing others as less than us. Father, forgive us those places where we see ourselves as better than others. Forgive us when we want to give up. Forgive us when we put trust in things that are not of you. But more than anything, Lord, help remind us that we alone can get grace and truth and hope and forgiveness through the name of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. And so this parable continues if we dive into it in verse 1. It says, he told them a parable to the effect that they ought not to, that how they ought to always pray and not to lose heart, not to give up. He tells the story of, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him saying, Give me justice against my adversary. And for a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so she will not beat me down by her continual cunning. And the Lord said to her, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not the, the God give justice to his, his elect, to his saints, to the people he loves? who cry to him day and night, will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give them justice speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So this parable, more than anything, teaches us that even worldly judges can be beat down by continual petitions. And what God is saying is that we don't need to beat him down for him to hear our cries for help, that he hears them, that he loves us when we come to him, that, that we shouldn't give up in praying. Uh, my wife loves to remind me so often in the Psalms, those Psalms of lament, those songs that, that, that are, are kind of downcast, that start out really dark and they, they start out, my God, my God, in Psalm 22, why have you forsaken me? But we have to keep reading the Psalm. My, my wife, Heather, she keeps saying, pray to the end of the Psalm, read to the end of the Psalm. Don't stop in the middle, but go to the end where it ends in hope. Every lament psalm ends with confidence in the Lord, ends with a, a declaration of faith that says, even so, my God is my rock, rock, my refuge, my strong tower. I will trust in him. Even when everything else gives way, even when the foundations of the earth crumble, even in those moments, I will trust that God is still seated in his heavenly temple, it says in Psalm 11. God is still sovereign and good, that he is still in charge and sovereign and in control, that we can trust in him even when things don't seem to be going our way. In verse 9, it continues, he told another parable. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves and not in God, and that they were righteous, that they could be self-righteous and treated others as less than, as lower, treated others with contempt. He says, two went up to a temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. I love this, this parable. Uh, there's going to be a link in the, the, the discussion questions below of a link to a, a video of uh, the Bible uh, series that was on TV a while back. And it has a depiction of Jesus telling this parable right at Matthew, a tax collector, and right at another Pharisee. And I think that's an interesting idea of Jesus telling a parable at people, right? That the targeted audience feels targeted, right? Uh, and, and here in this text, Jesus continues. He says, um, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like those other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, even this tax collector in the back. 
I fast twice a week. I give a tithe of all that I get. But this tax collector, standing far off in the back row, and he didn't lift up his hides to heaven. He had his whole countenance downcast, and he beat his breast, and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The reason I love that video that I shared a link down below is I love this moment where Jesus and Matthew are both saying the same words at the same time, where they say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, that, that Jesus has heard his cry for help and is offering his hand to invite even a tax collector to follow Jesus. There's nothing we can do in our past. There's nothing that we have that we carry with us that can disqualify us from Jesus offering his hand to saying, come and follow me. Jesus concludes his story with this idea. I tell you this, that the man, this man, the tax collector, went to his house, to his home justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself, they'll be brought down and humbled. But the one who humbles himself, he, by God, will be exalted. This is a theme throughout the New Testament, throughout the um, teachings of Jesus, and throughout the prophets of the Old Testament, that those that are humbled will actually be lifted up. That, that, that though we can be prideful, though we can believe in ourselves, that we can struggle with real legalism, with unrealistic expectations that we place on ourselves, that God wants to humble us so that we can trust in him and not ourselves. As I've learned how to be a dad to David over these first three months of his life, today he turns three months old. We're really excited about that. And as we've learned in these last three months, I've learned that there's a lot of Pharisee and legalism in me as a dad, that I want to do it right. I want to do it perfectly. I want to be the perfect dad for David. But what I've learned in even just three short months is that's not reasonable or possible, that I can't be a superhero. It's not my call to be Jesus, to be God, to be perfect, but instead to point David to who is, to point David to the perfect one, the one who is famous and incredible and awesome and glorious, that I don't have to be, that I don't have to be perfect, that I don't have to do everything the right way every time. And that freedom is not a freedom to be lazy, a freedom to not do anything, but it's a freedom to not put unnecessary pressures on my shoulder. I had a, a friend counsel me this week and, and, and say this very idea of, Will, you're not a superhero. He even sang the, the Mighty Mouse song, right? here to save the day, right? Like that, that I don't have to be that kind of person. I don't have to carry that burden. But instead, we, we, we're called to, to, to see that God can carry us through any season, to not think of ourselves too highly, not to treat others with contempt, but also to not lose heart, to not give up, to not think our past disqualifies us from Jesus offering us rescue. Last week, we studied the story of the Good Samaritan, and Samaritans were people that the Jews looked down on. Tax collectors were the same kind of people. The tax collectors were people that, 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 that people looked down on. The video that you can watch in the link below even references tax collectors as less than human, as vermin, as rodents, as something just, just worthless, right? And yet, Jesus loves them. You see, our job isn't to expose or point out the shortcomings or, or failures of others like the Pharisees, but instead to connect with the struggling tax collector and everyone around us, to admit first that we're sinners in need of a Savior, first our need for Jesus, and then connect with others to say, I'm, I'm a mess, I need Jesus every day, and then say, hey, maybe you might need Jesus too. But not in a southern way, right, of, ugh, man, he really needs Jesus. But in a loving, like, Christian, kind way of maybe they're going through struggles that I can't even see. I'm a big fan of this song, uh, A Little Bit of Everything by Dawes. I want to read you a couple lines from the, the middle verse of it, where there's this um, old man who sits at a buffet line. He's smiling and holding out his plate. And the further he looks back into his timeline, the hard load that always led him to today. And making up for where his bright future had left him, making up for the fact that his only son is gone. 
and letting out everything once his server asked him, have you figured out yet what it is you want? Be careful when you ask open-ended questions like that. Sometimes people might answer that question honestly. He responds, I'll take a little bit of everything, the biscuits and the beans, whatever forgets, what helps me to forget these things that have brought me to my knees. So pile on those mashed potatoes and an extra chicken wing because I'm having a little bit of everything. In our own lives, in the lives of those around us, there are things that bring us to our knees. What Jesus is teaching us in these two parables is to not lose heart, to when we're brought to our knees, to, bring, to keep going, right? To pray on our knees, right? To, to bring those things that, that have humbled us, that have brought us low, that make us feel like the tax collector, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. But don't end there. Receive the gifts and mercy of God. Don't end in the middle of the psalm. Pray to the end where it says, and yet I will hope and trust and put my confidence in God, my rock of salvation, that, that I won't end in despair, but I'll allow God to lift me up in hope, that I won't end my prayer in the middle, that I will always drive that prayer towards hope, towards forgiveness. And my, my prayer is that, that whatever our little bit of everything is, he says elsewhere in the song, uh, of these other things that, that led him to humility, that led him to be humbled, he says it's a little bit of everything. It's the mountains. It's a fog. It's the news on six o'clock. It's the death of my first dog. It's the angels up above me. It's the song they don't sing. It's a little bit of everything. So I don't know where you are today. I don't know what your little bit of everything is. And that's what I want you to really dive into in your discussion questions for today. What's your little bit of everything in your own life? What are those burdens you're carrying that you need to carry to the cross, carry to Jesus, carry to God in prayer? And then, who's one person in your life that's going through a little bit of everything, that's carrying a burden that it isn't theirs to carry? How can you be light and encouragement today? How can you lift them up in prayer each and every day? I actually just got a text right before I started filming this of an old friend of ours that, that um, had a son that passed away today. And I'm a brokenhearted for this family, and I, I don't even know where to begin to encourage or give them hope. But what I do know is that I can pray for them, that I can pray for their little bit of everything that's hitting them all at once. I can pray for them. I can, I can be there for them. I can pray alongside of them as well. And then I can point them to the hope of the resurrection. I can point them to Jesus. But even in these difficult circumstances, we still have a God who loves us. We have an Emmanuel, a God who is with us, even when we walk through the valley of shadow of death. Even when we fear evil, even when we feel alone, God is there with us. There is no darkness that his light cannot light up. There is no pain that he cannot walk alongside of us. And God promises us one day he will make all things new. He will recreate all things. That death will be an ancient memory and tears will be no more. And until that day, we should never give up in praying. We should never lose heart. But we should continue to be faithful in prayer. And we should always be humble about who we are because God has lifted us up out of the pit, out of the... the the, the muck that we were in, the mess that we were in, and has lifted us up and given us peace and hope to share with others. Hope you guys have a great week, and God bless. Once for all, our debt is paid.